you good with both of them? Mr. President, I move that we uh, move on 9A, 9B. Thank you. Do I have a second? We have a motion and a second. Any comments? Case we should we should adopt the entire resolution because it's necessary to make certain findings to authorize the sale. Can we have a second on that? Second. Yeah, second. Like the resolution? resolution. I understand, Mr. President, that the sense of the uh, motion would be to adopt this resolution if it's appropriate. Right. <laughs> this is a resolution to authorize the sale of unused and unnecessary real property. Uh, whereas the Eastern Area School District is the owner of a certain parcel of real estate consisting of approximately 0.7 acres and located at 811 Northampton Street, Eastern Northampton County, Pennsylvania, with tax map parcel L9SE1B-16-15, and whereas the school board has determined that the property is unused and unnecessary for school purposes, and whereas the school board believes that by selling the property at private sale, it could obtain a fair and reasonable price and a better price than it could be obtained by public sale. And whereas it is the intent of the school board that the property be usefully developed to, benefit, to the benefit of the community is therefore resolved, one, that the property is unused and unnecessary for school purposes, and two, that the property be offered for sale at private sale as permitted by Section 707.3 of the Pennsylvania School Code, and that the buyer shall demonstrate a plan for the property that will promptly restore and develop the property to productive use. And four, that the administration and solicitor are directed to secure a buyer consistent with the terms of this resolution. Anybody who the resolution? We have a motion and a second. Any questions? Um, I just have one comment based on the
President, may I, may I respond to the sure. um, uh, <coughs> last, uh, last, last meeting, you may recall that I um, issued some uh, considerations and admonitions with respect to what we couldn't, couldn't do. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this resolution was drafted uh, for the specific purpose of, of um, authorizing the board uh, and and indicating that it was the intent of the board to consider uh, both the use that the buyer was to make of the property uh, as well as the promptitude which the, uh, the buyer could give to, to the project so it wouldn't be sitting there for some period of time. Now, having said that, um, uh, and while it is the uh, intent of this resolution, that the, uh, that the school board uh, should consider the use that the buyer intends to make of the property. Uh, I cannot say that if uh, another buyer came in with a higher price, um, that uh, we can necessarily insist upon uh, any particular use. But this does at least require that the school board uh, inquire as to what the use that is to be made and also uh, the time, time frame within which the property could be developed before it enters into an agreement. So, so in drafting this, uh, we tried to address the concerns of the community group with regard to a responsible developer uh, as well as someone who could put the property <coughs> back into a uh, productive condition and reduce the Any other comments? <laughs>
Thank you. Any other comments? I, I, I just wanted to offer um, the thanks about the fact that the Board of Trustees and the
Are there other considerations? Or yeah. Um, I, um, I, I understand 100% what Mr. Ryder uh, has mentioned. I, I can't go to the 2.2. Um, I'd like to move to a 1.7 and 1.5 to 2 million that the surplus. I think the utility would be a little short. But I, I'd like to decrease, obviously. I know where we're at. We can't do it, but I'd like to hold steady at 1.7. Um, I feel the benefit to the district from a 1.7 to a 2.2 isn't as great as the, the harm of 1.7 to a 2.2 to the taxpayer. So for that reason, I, I would like to see a 1.7 and I'll go with the 2 million surplus. I'll take the comment, but at this point we have the motion in the second. So we'll eventually have to vote that one. And if that doesn't comply with the majority, and again, remember, this is a goal. This doesn't set everything in solid stone yet. Okay. Uh, that we would have to move on to something. Yeah, and my comment is, is that if we keep lowering our reserve and we need something very badly or something breaks within our school system, which it has in the past, uh, since I've been on here, uh, that 1.7 as a reserve is not going to carry us. We're supposed to have almost 10% of our budget as a reserve. Okay. Let me explain. Currently, the reserve is approximately 13 million. Yeah, right. right. And this would be reducing it by 1.5. Yes. So we would still, we're a little bit below the 10%. Right. Okay. And, but what I'm saying is, is that we are on a decline that every year we are pulling something out of it. And we just have to watch it very closely because we may not have a, a garden to go to to get any vegetables someday if we need them. And so that's, that's my main concern. It was much higher, and, and it is lower, and if we keep continuing on this path, we will have a, a very hard time four or five years from now. Other comments? I just want to say that any time you start talking about raising taxes on any level, whether it be school board, city of East, or county, whatever, it's a tough sell. And most people look at raising taxes as a being a negative. Uh, I may be a very strange person, my wife says I am, but I look at this particular type of tax, in this particular case, as being a positive. Because if you start cutting programs to make a budget, and say, well, they, we don't need to have uh, middle school softball. We don't need to have middle school basketball. We don't need to have middle school wrestling. We don't need to have a uh, debate club. We don't need to have that. But you start saying that, and then somebody speaks up and says, well, they can all go to Palmer and play softball and so on and so forth. Well, when you register in any of the suburbs to play any sports, there's a registration fee. When you play sports in high school, or junior high school, middle school, there is no registration fee. That's too, that's a cat amount to pay and play. I don't know what would happen in the, in the West Ward. I don't know what would happen on Fifth Street. I don't know any of the situation, but I can bet that they have a registration fee for police athletic league, and they're going to be paying out of pocket. Whereas when you raise taxes a minimum amount of money, 2%, 2.2%, you're talking maybe 65 cents a day. A lot of people, um, well, we just talked about how people want the best for their kids. They're going to pay 30 bucks for a soft seat in a bathroom in a bus when they can have it for less than half of that in the school district. So when people start looking seriously at what this school district offers, in my opinion, second to none. What this school district offers, and you're asking them to pay, let's say, 65, 90 cents a day more than what they're already paying to keep very, very important programs. 
and in some cases, uh, and I have, and by the way, people, I have no knowledge of what the discussion has been in budget because I'm not on the budget committee, and the budget committee doing their job, doing the right thing, they're not letting that this out. So I'm just guessing. I'm just putting on top of my head. How do we make budget? Well, all the things that I mentioned plus. You people travel, you move around, go across the bridge. <coughs> when you get across the bridge, turn left and find Fultzburg High School. And then the next thing you need to do is identify the high school. It has 52 temporary buildings because somebody doesn't care and nobody has stood up and said anything over there or not enough people have said anything they can't even get athletic fields built the state keeps giving them money taking money away we have a state that's getting close to that we have a state that doesn't care about public education even though it's a priority. It says so in the state constitution. It's a priority, public education. But they don't care. We gave the appropriate budgets for community college, Eastern Public Library, uh, colonial unit, etc., etc., way before we do any of ours. None of those budgets were a problem. Community college will still have their sports. Community college will still have their programs. They'll, ch they'll charge a little bit more for their tuition. Then it comes to us, and we gave half of our money away already. And we have to cut our programs. So when somebody says to me, Oh, you're going to have to pay more taxes. My answer is good, because then I can, we can have a chance of keeping what we have. We're not going to get a lot more, but we can keep what we have. I can't even imagine what it would be like if we didn't have the programs that we have in this school. Today, the fourth grade class at Palmer went down to a history lesson from the mayor, Mayor Panto. And... If you listen to him tell that story, being an ex-teacher in the district, it, it almost it just got, grabbed you because those kids were genuinely interested in what this town was all about way back when. And he was the, he was the teacher. He was the man telling them. And he made the statement, Mr. Pinnabone was there, Mr. Ryder was there, he made the statement that when somebody says the Eastern School District and says something negative about it, he says, I get very, very angry. He said, because this school district has so much to offer. And if you don't like what you see over in Folksburg, you might want to travel up 22 and spend a day at Deer for Allen. And you might want to go to a basketball game or a wrestling match or a football game or one of those places. And you, you'll be able to sit there before the first quarter's over, count the number of people that are there. Because somebody doesn't care. And I would hate to see that happen here. I, I just can't believe that there are that many people in this community who can't afford 65 cents a day more than what they're already paying. Mr. Orange? Yes. <laughs> I felt like I was in class again the way you did it. <laughs> um, uh, it uh, just, just to address two, two of your comments. If you can't believe that there's people that would be affected negatively by even a minimal um, tax increase, then I welcome you to spend the weekend with me and hang out with me in my neighborhood. Um, and unfortunately, it would, it, it would affect. Also, to your point of raising taxes um, for better programs and, and for the services we offer, that, that's a great thing. However, all I'm going to say on that is I don't think we're 
we're looking to increase taxes based on programs or services. I don't think that's the, our services are the reason why we're looking at a tax increase. Um, so I just, I just don't agree with the comment at this time. I think at this point, you know, we're trying to give some parameters so that Mr. Simonetta can actually develop the budget and tell us what impact it's going to have and what programs are going to be impacted and what's going to have to occur uh, across the district. So that, that's the purpose of setting this. So he has some guidelines and he can come back with something. I'd like to make a comment on the parameters that um, we're trying to set and approach the budget that we're looking at. I continue to feel very strongly that our community is still suffering
and, and the board members will see right out what we have to do. So there's no hiding of anything, which I know you're not doing, but I think this way, uh, it's an open case. You know, this is what we do under this, this is what we do under this. But in other words, what you're saying is we prepare both ways 1.7 and 2.2, but still maintaining the 1.5 million from the surplus. Yes, I'm going to go for that. Okay, hearing that, I'm going to ask a question. The person that made the motion and the person that seconded the motion are you okay with that as being general direction for Mr. Simonetta? Yes. Okay. okay. So with that being said, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor, aye. That being the proposal. Aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. Okay. So that will carry for now. Again, this is our guidelines. This does not walk us into where the budget may end up. But it's what will be prepared. Under new business, moving ahead, we have the resignation of Roberta Hoagland from the public library. Can I have a motion to accept that? And also authorize the advertising for filling the base. I'd like to uh, accept that with regret. She has been a very hard worker, and uh, uh, she's been on the board for three or four years and in those three or four years she has given a lot of her time to the board. Thank you. I think you would agree that she is a dedicated person. And we have a second. Any other comments? <coughs> All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? The next one, uh, we had a request from a student for admission to the high school. It has been uh, Recommended by the administration, first of all by uh, Mr. Cuck and then by Mr. Hurst, to deny the student. So, can I have a motion to deny? Motion. Second. A motion and a second. And any other comments? All those in favor, <coughs> aye. Aye. Opposed? And last but not least, based on what we just did with our uh, talking about the budget and everything, and cutting things tight on how we put Mr. Simonetta on the schedule. Uh, I would like to recommend that April 4th, that evening, and I'll say starting at 6 o'clock, we would hold a special meeting at Easton High School in the auditorium for a presentation on how this budget and what this means based on the parameters we set. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. A motion and a second. Any other comments on that? All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? There's been a lot of emails that have gone back and forth. This is not only an agenda, it's just a comment by me, but it's related to the uh, action we just took. There was great appreciation by this board, and I think also by some comments made in the community, that everything that was done by this staff for setting up and making all the arrangements and everything to move to Chester was greatly appreciated. The accommodation, the setup, the work, the moving, both by the staff there, by the administrative staff and everything. Again, we, I think we all on behalf of the board want to say thank you to everybody. And now, with that being said, moving on in the agenda, interested citizen, non-agenda items. You can all start to hands. Please. Good evening. My name is Jill Jacobson, and I'm actually here in my official PTA capacity tonight. Um, you've been provided some misinformation tonight about field trips, and I would just like to take a moment to clarify it, especially in relation to the Conrad Philadelphia field trip, which was not on your agenda tonight. Uh, the Conrad PTA works very hard to raise money to establish some really interesting field trips for its students. And it does not charge students to go to the field trips. There is no $30 fee to students. It is free. Everything is free. There is, however, a group of parents who want to accompany their students. And they have asked the PTA if they would provide them with a bus in addition to the zoo. So we have, at their request, to provide an additional bus and we charge those parents $30 so that they can accompany their children on this field trip. 
Parents don't have to do that. They, they can also attend and not take the bus. bus. They can drive and take far less. So, so I want to be really clear. clear. There is no pay. Um, I know the question has come up about whether we use district busing in the 75 miles, which is not something we're required to do. Palmer is one of the few schools in the district. We're going to Philadelphia is within 75 miles of Maryland. It's the same field trip for most of our other schools. We wouldn't even be allowed to use district busing. And I really can't understand how anybody expects us to drive to Philadelphia and spend meaningful time there but be back by 2 o'clock, which is our requirement. If the Palmer field trip does not return until 5 p.m., then we can't do that with district busing. So it really isn't an option for us at all. And the last thing I really want to point out is that you cut us a break on district busing. It comes out of the school district budget every time we use the school district bus. And we take that really seriously. So if we're able to raise the funds and arrange for busing, we're saving you money. And I want you to know there's nothing in it financially if we use one bus or another bus. We're making a decision we think is the right decision for our children. And if we think private busing and adequate facilities on that bus is appropriate, that's what we feel we need to do. We allow every child to go on these trips. And we have children with medical issues. You approved on the uh, agenda tonight by adding nurses to go on another field trip. We are required to take nurses on most of our field trips. We have students with medical issues. And sometimes putting them on a 73 or 74 mile trip somewhere when they're in second grade, um, you know, it's just it's not the appropriate thing. So we take these decisions very, very carefully and feel that we do the right thing for our children. Thank you. Thank you. I saw another hand back there. Yes, yes sir. sir. Thank you again, Mr. President. Each year we have the same discussion that we listen to it about the world is coming to an end, we've got to cut this or taxes will go up. Um, but very rarely has anyone taken an initiative in terms of cultivating and improving the tax base. And let me just address two areas which are very, very difficult, but eventually somebody needs to take a look at them. One, this area of Pennsylvania loses approximately a billion dollars a year in taxes to the east to New York. And I'm talking about state, city, local governments. And if Harrisburg doesn't have the money, then somebody else has to put it in the pot. So they lose it, it all goes to New York, and they kiss it goodbye. Now, I don't know how you could stop Manhattan is one of the richest counties in the U.S. and has some of the highest wages to be paid. If you take a Wall Street firm like Goldman Sachs, every salary last year exceeded $400,000 average, which means, roughly speaking, if you live in East New York for Goldman Sachs, that's $20,000 that goes out. Um, it's going to get worse. If you work at home and never set foot in New York under Pennsylvania's antiquated laws, we get nothing. It all goes to New York. Now, I know tax attorneys that tell me I'm nuts. But Connecticut is smarter than Pennsylvania. If you sit at home in Connecticut and get paid out of New York, Connecticut gets paid too. And the Supreme Court has denied jurisdiction over that question. So Pennsylvania ought to be at least as smart as Connecticut and get those well paid executives and what have you that live in Easton and work in Easton and get paid out of New York. It's time to stop being stupid. Um, and while you're at it, why would you pick up a KOZ or a Lerda to build more parking lots and more bus terminals for people to leave town? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Now, next, I'm going to try to squeeze it into two and a half minutes. Landlords, they are a smarter creature than homeowners, and you're only doing your taxes and you're worried about the little tiny rates you get. Trust me. Landlords get more tax breaks out of more different hands than you ever thought of. They're smarter, they lobby better, they got things done better, they had better friends, they had better attorneys. Easton has twice the state average of landlord operated properties. Now, they put less in the pot than you as a homeowner do. Now, somebody put mentioned two and a half percent inflation increase. We negotiated an agreement decades ago, before I had diapers, I'm sure. 
uh, the Eastern Housing Authority and you gave yourself zero percent increase. You're paying them the same thing that uh, you paid them before Mr. Freund was born. Uh, sewer rates went up, electric rates went up, cost of education went up, you didn't get anything out of the pot. Now, that's the extreme. But the average is that the landlord puts in very, very little compared to a homeowner. And Easton is too friendly to landlords. Far too friendly. You need to be much more restrictive. You get the homeowner a break, you give yourself some more money, and make the landlords less rich as they go running off to the bank because they're making a lot of money in many different ways that I can't explain in a minute, 23 seconds. But I've been a landlord, and I went to B-School, and I can run through the tax code, and I can tell you that there's plenty of ways to do it. But we need to be less hospitable, and it will make them pay more. And then again, we do not need to give blurs, KOZs, and all kinds of tax duties to landlords. Put them to better use. And you as a school district need not cooperate with things that don't benefit you. Now, it may be nice to the city, but the city doesn't necessarily do what's best for education. And education, believe it or not, is far more important in tomorrow's world than the role of the city. Trust me, education will be here long after the city is someplace else. You need to be much more assertive in doing what's right for your tax base so you can afford to do the things that are good. You can argue about what's good all day long, but if you don't have the money, you can't do the things that Mr. Arntz wants done, or anybody else wants done, or anybody here wants done. So we need to stop giving favors through for the wrong reasons to leaders, landlords, to those two classes of people. They're not doing anything wrong. They're just smarter. And they're taking appropriate use of all of the breaks that we give them. Uh, my name is uh, Aaron Adams. I'm a resident of Lower Salton Township. I'm here tonight to uh, comment on the use of objectionable resource materials and curriculum. I'm referring to a highly controversial nonfiction book, Nick Lindheim. Over two years ago, I submitted a citizen's request for reconsideration of the work in an effort to improve the curriculum. And I did so according to policy 109. Mr. First formed the committee of teachers and administrators to determine if their boss made a mistake when she initially approved the use of Nick Lundheim. No parents or any other members of the community were invited to participate in the process. Not surprisingly, the teachers and the administrators reaffirmed the superintendent's decision and my request was uh, to remove the book was rejected. However, policy 109 gives the school board the explicit authority to overrule Dr. McGinley's decision. So I appealed to the school board back in January of 2010. Since then, the school board has failed to participate in the process. To the best of my knowledge, the issue was never put on the agenda, and there was never any open discussion of the matter. Not one single board member ever raised a motion to vote on the removal of the book. And that includes uh, current board members, Dr. Walkham and Mr. Riley. There are now six new members on the board and a new president, so I'm back to renew my request. Mrs. Matthews recently informed me that she will not vote to stop using the Nicola I thank her for sharing her position, uh, both with me and her constituents. Mr. Parks informed me that he is against censorship. He seems to suggest that school directors have no right to interfere with the curriculum. But in fact, Policy 109 clearly shows that this is a misconception. The school board is legally responsible for all matters relating to the operation of the school district. Although the selection of the resource materials is delegated to the superintendent, the ultimate responsibility for the content of the curriculum rests with the school board. So it's not a matter of being for or against censorship, it's simply a matter of being for or against the use of nickel and dime in the curriculum. Why do schools center the curriculum? Well, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that the amount of time a student spends in school is extremely limited. As I recall, the number of books assigned to a typical high school student is arguably in the range of 30 to 50 books. Let's say it's 50 books to be conservative. And yet there's literally millions of books available on the free market. 
almost two million books on, for sale on Amazon alone. After you filter out the religious books, the romance novels, the conspiracy theories, and all the pornography, I'm sure there's still many thousands of books available uh, that have some educational value. So the superintendent has given a tremendous task of picking only 50 books from thousands available to put into the curriculum. We should not be so shocked when a superintendent, any superintendent, makes an occasional mistake. And clearly, that's the purpose of a policy 109. It includes a citizen's request for reconsideration of work. That's the mechanism for correcting a mistake occasionally what happens, but inevitably it does. So it's very clear that the school board is not only authorized to remove objectionable material from the curriculum, but the school board is also responsible for the curriculum. For a school director to ignore a request to remove a particular resource material is to endorse the continued use of that particular resource material in the curriculum. Okay, so what criteria might a school director consider to determine if a given book should be plucked from the thousands of books available and placed in a highly selective list of the 50 books assigned to the students? Well, I think we can all agree that the curriculum should not contain books that promote specific political agendas. I'm not referring to vague political ideas or concepts. I'm talking about the use of public funds to persuade students to go out and help enact actual legislation. Do you not realize that Enigma 109 was written by a self-described political activist and founding co-chair of a national political organization? And then the publisher intentionally markets the book for use in public schools and colleges. On page 235, for example, the author literally advises your students to go join an organization like ACORN to help push her political agenda. This is just one of four reasons why I ask you to remove this book from the curriculum. I see that my time is almost up. Um, I'm going to ask the question anyway. Would you grant me 90 more seconds, please, to tell you the truth? Okay, just asking. Uh, so I'll just wrap it up and say, please remove the Nicola Dimes from the elite list of the which, which is the curriculum of the Eastern High School. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Adams, I have one question. Mr. President, actually, Mr. Hurst, the uh, committee that Mr. Adams speaks of, I could be wrong. Um, I was under the impression that parents were invited and participated in that committee. Am I correct or am I wrong? Yes, and uh, one of our parents that happens to serve on the board of the committee that actually killed Nathan Sinn, or the PDA president. With parents involved. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't invited. May I ask a quick question? Were my arguments uh, presented to the committee at the end? They were based on the entire committee's uh, reasoning. Okay. So everyone on that committee supported continuing to use the books. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. 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 Yes, sir. Sal Rizzo, 900 Butler Street, West Warren Easton. I have been asked to read some excerpts from this book to at least give you the impression of what, what goes on. The preaching goes on, interrupted with beautiful amen. It would be nice if someone would read the sad eye throughout the Sermon on the Mount, accompanied by a rousing commentary on income inequality and the need for a height in the minimum wage. But Jesus makes his appearance here only as the course. The living man, the wine and guzzling vagrant, and precocious socialist is never once mentioned, nor anything he ever had to say. Christ crucified rules. And it may be that the true business of modern Christianity is to crucify him again and again, so he can never get a word out of his mouth. I get up to leave and I walk out to search for my car, half expecting to find Jesus out there in the dark, gagged and tethered to a tent pole. I don't look so good by the end of the day, referring to her job as a strong woman, I recall and probably smell like eau de toilette and sweat. But it's the brilliant green and yellow uniform that gives me away, like prison clothes on a fugitive. Maybe it occurs to me, I'm getting a tiny glimpse 
Uh, what what it's like, like to, to be black. black. If it weren't for the drug test, I would have stopped looking right then and there. But there has been a chemical indiscretion in recent weeks, and I'm not at all sure I can pass. If I had used cocaine or heroin, there would be no problem. These are water soluble and washed out of the body in a couple of days. LSD isn't even tested for. But my indiscretion about the only drug usually direct detected by testing. Marijuana, which is fat soluble, and I have read, can linger in the body for months. In spirit of contrition for multiple sins, I decided to devote the weekend to detox. A web search revealed that I'm on a heavily traveled path. There are dozens of sites offering help to the would be drug test pastor, mostly in the form of adjustable products. Though one site promises to send a bottle of pure, drug free urine that are heated to body temperature. Since I don't have time to order and receive any drug evasion tech products, I linger over a site in which hundreds of letters, typically with subject line reading, help, tested in three days, are soberly answered by Alec. Here I learn that my leanness is an advantage. There aren't too many places for the cannabis derivatives to hide out in. And that the only effective method is to flush the damn stuff with massive quantities of fluid at least three gallons a day. To hurry the process, there is a product called Clean Pee, supposedly available to GNC. So I drive 15 minutes to the nearest one, swinging tap water from an egg in a bottle all the way, and asking the kid manning the place where his detox products are kept. Maybe he's used to a stream of mom-like women demanding clean tea because it leads to be poker face to an impressively large locked glass case. Locked either because the average price of GNC's detox products is $49.95 or because the market is thought to consist of desperate and not particularly law-abiding individuals. I read the ingredients and buy two of them separately. Creatinine and a diuretic called Uberus for thirty dollars. So here's the program: drink water at all times, along with frequent doses of diuretic, and my own scientific contribution: avoid salt in any form at all, since it encourages water retention, meaning no processed foods, fast foods, etc. If I want that job in plumbing and art, I have to make myself into an unobstructed pipe. Water in and water just to secure and drink all coming out. Ladies and gentlemen, this book is, in, is teaching people how to get a drug test. How can we present this as literature for the curriculum for our kids? It basically teaches them how to be dishonest. So I ask you, please, in consideration of, our, of the students of the school district, please remove this book from the curriculum and please put it to a vote. Thank you. And I, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Eric Ganzo. I'm on the uh, uh, 300 block of North 12th Street in West Ward. I want to thank all of you for um, taking a rant from two individuals that have just stood up. That's this book. I have not read the book, but I can tell you as a teenager, I knew everything that you read. I knew where to get stuck. I had friends with, you know, same exact thing. If the kids want to know it, they'll find it. But the fact of the matter is, though, like, I'm trying to make every meeting now, and two, uh, one month ago, we listened to a young girl who was um, on the debate team talk about how she had different views. She, those books are on there to promote this type of discussion. That's the purpose of them. I've had um, a friend of mine in college, there were some drawings that were borderline sexual harassment type of things. You would not be putting these things at your desk at work. But in the academic, they, they, the teacher basically asked, okay, are you for or against this meeting in the public space? Well, she was against. And because she was against, and those that were for, they had to write the opposite view. Books are, it, I agree with Mr. Arms completely, it's censorship. 
It's in every way of form. It's to sit there and invoke in discussion. If we do not invoke discussion, what are we doing here? That's the purpose of education. Thank you. Hey, my name is Eric Ritter. I am a senior in high school. And I just happened to have read this book. We were discussing it one time. I read it for a class in 11th grade. And I would like to say that, first of all, the quotes that were discussed were taken were taken dramatically out of context. And at the beginning of the book, and also by the teacher, we were informed to look at this not as a political work, not as trying to promote your views on them, but just as another introduction into different opinions and also the way of life of minimum wage workers. The book discusses, at its main points, it's not liberalism and drug use. It is to show how someone on a minimum wage salary can not possibly survive by themselves enough to rent a house, to afford food, any of that. But the point is to introduce the different views to the students, not promote the agenda. Also, um, some of the things they mentioned about teaching us how to use drugs or how to pass drug tests while on drugs. Yes, that can be found anywhere you want. I mean, we have the internet, for God's sake. I mean, if I wanted to find anything, I wouldn't be looking through a 300 page book about minimum wage workers to find out how to pass a drug test at my grocery store job. It's just, I don't think it's a valid cause to ban a book and I don't think books should be banned at all. It's censorship, completely right. And other societies, other groups have tried to ban books with different levels of successes. And in the end, it doesn't end up, doesn't end up too well. I'm thinking other extreme societies who have done it. And not something we want to see. That's pretty much it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to walk back to your seat. Um, I want to applaud you for speaking tonight, not because of your opinion, um, but the fact that you read the book and you were willing as a, a senior to come out tonight and, and made your opinion felt and you, you did it very well. Um, whether people agree or disagree with you, you did it very well. And, uh, we're proud to have you here. Thank you. So another hand in the back there. Yes, sir. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. I will be reading uh, excerpts from uh, Nick and Nick. My name is William Worsley. I'm um, from the Fifth Ward. Thank you. In Chapter 2, the author describes her experience cleaning private homes. She makes a uh, reference to cleaning floors from her hands and knees on page 84. But it is this primal posture of submission and of what is ultimately annual accessibility that seems to gratify the consumers of maid services. I don't know what um, Mrs. Debbie Swartz is hard stone, I think, or at least a stone-like substance. And we have no knee pads with us today. I thought my uh, middle-class innocence that knee pads were one of uh, Monica Lewinsky's uh, Peruvian fantasies, but no. They actually exist. And they, they're usually, they're usually, uh, they're usually um, stand up of, of equipment, of our equipment. Page 89. Do the only owner have any idea of the misery that goes into rendering their homes, uh, homes motel perfect? Would they be bothered if they uh, know? Or would they take sadistic pride in what they have purchased? Or seem to dinner guests, for example, that their floors are clean only with the purest of human hairs? Uh, I'm sorry, human tears. Page 92. <laughs> Let's talk about shit for example. It happens, as the bumper sticker says, and it happens to cleaning people um, 
uh, MMA. The, the first time, time I encountered uh, Chase Bangs, Bang's told us uh, that the main, I was, I was shocked by a sense, sense of unwanted and intimacy. A few hours ago, ago some well-fed butt was straining away, straining away, or was it still to And now here I am, wiping it up, wiping uh, up after it. For those, those of you who have never played a really dirty tool, I should explain to, uh, that there are three kinds of shit stains. There are remnants of landslides running down the inside of the toilet bowls. There are remnants of landslides running, uh, uh, there are the uh, slash back remains on the other side of the toilet seats. And perhaps most repulsively, there is sometimes a crust of brown on the rim of the toilet seat. Where a turret happens uh, to collide on the, uh, uh, collide on the dive into the water. Now, page 108. A couple of my co-workers, uh, team leaders, in fact, delight in putting the potential to the middle and terrorizing the elegant neighbors, the neighborhood we uh, serve. I would be surprised if complaints in fact, to, um, to tag about one particular driver, we, uh, driver decided to go screeching around the neighborhood containing several of our houses, blurring out rat right tape, consisting largely of words, fuck you, asshole, and a kinky permutation thereof, while an owner type pushing a stroller cringes on the sidewalk. We laughed ourselves silly in the back seat. Clutching our armrests and trying not to, uh, not to get sick. But this time, a rebellion threatens only the rare pedestrian member of the owning class. Uh, the officer shares her thoughts on questions about uh, all the job drug use and theft on premium uh, employment tests on page 127. The personality test, for example, the truth is I don't much care if my fellow workers are getting high. In the bar not or lifting the occasional retail item. And I certainly wouldn't say that you if I did. Thank, Thank you for your time. time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord, members, for your time and in the uh, hearing these excerpts serving as they are. Elected well, members, I want to thank you uh, again. I'm sorry, my name is Ronnie Del Baco, 636 Site Street. It's, it's important, it's an important educational matter of the vulgarity and promotion of illegal drug use contained in the approved curriculum materials for our children. It needs to be taken seriously. Upon entering the building, I noticed a sign, a big sign on the left that says, Drug Free School Zone. In 2007, the Supreme Court ruled in the matter of Morris versus Frederick, where they decided that a principal uh, made a decision to suspend a student based on his free speech, where he was promoting illegal drug use. The Supreme Court decided that we can't use school speech or free speech to promote illegal drug use, and then we should not allow our teachers or administrators to make excuses cloaked under the um, banner of stimulating controversial discussion to make it okay and approve and go against the spirit of a drug-free school zone. Surely you'll agree that the promotion of illegal drugs on the school property in any form, be it implied or direct, is as intolerable as the act itself and should be eradicated with all the severity of the spirit of a drug-free school zone. The Eastern Area School District Policy 109 clearly states that in picking the materials, they're going to provide material that will stimulate growth, factual knowledge, literary appreciation, aesthetic values, and ethical standards. Nickel and Dime, a nonfiction book, instead promotes editorial <coughs> opinion, moral corruption, illegal drug use, and anything but ethical standards. The Policy 109 also states that it's going to place principle above personal opinion, reason above prejudice, and the selection of materials of the highest quality to ensure an appropriate, comprehensive collection. In approving this book, Mrs. McGinley's administration has not placed principle above personal opinion. Reason above prejudice is thrown aside, 
and in the bar for materials of the highest quality, and so the job to the floor. So based on the indifferent standards and rules set in place by the policy, 109, and your duty as elected board members to make sure that the administration selects the highest quality materials through the process described in the policy as we do, <coughs> not book burning. That's, That's when you select one book over another. It doesn't mean you're burning one book, it means you're selecting a better book. So the, the idea that this is book burning doesn't apply. Your own policy calls a meeting, so I'll refer to your policy. Also to the Supreme Court's ruling in Morris versus Frederick in the school speech promotion of illegal drug use. Also our own district zero tolerance policy on illegal drug activity. And, and your sworn duty as elected representatives to work in the best interest of our children. How is it acceptable to you that our children be subjected to such braggadocious claims of explicit illegal drug use, related instruction on covering it up, with unanimous approval of this administration through a vulgar, nonfiction, editorial style memoir, clothed in a banner, banner labeled critical analysis of differing and opposing views? Mr. Pinnabo? Dr. Volcano, Mr. Riley, in our neighborhood we have several children that are going to go through the high school. Would you want those kids in our neighborhood coming home from school, learning from our curriculum, how to do drugs and then be the drug test when they go for a job serving our community? Mr. Mosquitos is not here, I don't see him. Yeah, he talked about respons fiscal responsibility quite a bit. So is the purchase of this book for our curriculum really the best way to use our money? when there are other books that could be served the same purpose without the vulgarity. Tonight I'm asking someone on this board, the elected and sworn to protect the best interests of our children, to please make a motion to override Mrs. McGinley's decision and replace this book with the traditional time-tested work of real literature that actually meets the requirements set forth by the Policy 109. Or at least make the requirements set forth by Policy 109 Excuse me, or at least make a motion to have it placed on the agenda for a vote at next month's meeting before the budget talks become an excuse to delay the support matter any further. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other hands? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Please read from your seat, sir, and your name first. Uh, Matthew Bukowski, 12th grade student. Thank you. I have not personally read this uh, book, but I know um, a bunch of my friends have, including Eric Ritter and others to my left. Uh, the one question that I have to bring up is, did any parent or guardian of a student who has read this book come out against it? Has it only been other residents of Easton coming out against it? Also, has any student voiced any concern with this book whatsoever? Or is it just, again, people who are not not, not part, part of this curriculum, we're not part of this class. It's an AP English lit uh, language class. It's for AP students, and it's only that class that has that curriculum. It's 11th grade AP students. If they can't make up their own mind, I don't know who can. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Administrative staff. 
So I would ask that if you were going to do this, that you're very, very careful about doing this. I would ask, not that you wouldn't be, but I think you are attempting to do that, but I would ask that you frame it with no tax increase as the base, and perhaps the 1.7 at the max, or if you must, the 2.5. But I would really appreciate it as a taxpayer seeing what it really would look like, honestly, truthfully, what it will look like to make this budget work without a tax increase, what's going to be required, and let's focus, too, on the reductions in administrative spend. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? I commend her for that. 
Uh, one, one of the things that you people, and like I said, I don't really know, so let me, let me rephrase that. One, one of the things I think the school boards, other than Bethlehem, because I know them better, don't realize is that the, the well is dry. The taxpayers are broke. We're heading into economic times that are going to be strong, that are absolutely going to try the soul of everybody. If, if, if Greece and the euro dollar goes down, you people won't even get to 1.7. There's going to be chaos. So I, 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 what I see from Bethlehem anyway, and, and, and I'm, I'm not being really fair because I don't know their hearts and I don't know their minds, but one of the things I see is that they don't appear to be concerned about what may be coming upon them. And that's very concerning for a citizen. And what I see, also see on the board is that they're really not representing the citizen. They're more concerned, and rightly so, because the Constitution says that, that they have to, uh, a responsibility for the children and educating them. But the citizen now, the situation has changed towards the citizen, and I'm talking about the system. The structural system for taxation will no longer be carried by property. You have to seriously consider that and watch that carefully. There's a bill in, in Harrisburg right now. How many people in this room know anything about House Bill 1776? Has anybody heard of that bill? Very few. I would recommend that the board take a close look at that. It's, it's about to be introduced on the floor as a bill. Right now, you, you, the bill isn't there to read as whole, but you can get a lot of information off it. I highly recommend you, you do some searching on it, because the, the whole structure is, is about to cave in. But the property tax from the resident can no longer sustain the monies needed by the school districts. And that's the reality, that's a fact. The, the concerning thing is about what's the, the outer perimeter, what's going to happen there if, if the economy goes down, if the, if the euro goes down, and we have a, a serious uh, implosion. I would, I would highly recommend you look at House Bill 1776, and I would certainly consider zero, because I was trying to argue that point up there in Bethlehem, and it to no avail. Anyway, thank you very much. Any other hands? Seeing none, I want to make a general response back on the budget and the setting of parameters. As you just have been stating, there are six new members up here. And at the same time, when we came on, we recognized and we knew coming in that we were inheriting some situations that had to be dealt with and, and explained as we would move ahead. And this board at this point, if over the last couple of months have decided and discussed the fact and as we try to look at it moving ahead uh, we need A, some starting point and B, trying to look out if you've heard, we're trying to look out into at least four years ahead if not further but right now we're just trying to look past this year we know is going to be rather difficult but you have to have a starting point where you start to begin at and look at and understand what possible cuts and everything may have to be and they have to occur within this system. And that is the point of some of the parameters that were set tonight, so we can start to hear and understand and then know how the or how sharp that knife has to be from working with this budget that's coming here. It is going to be a difficult year, a difficult next two months, not a year. It's going to be a difficult next two months that we're looking at coming up. And uh, in another week, Mr. Simmons is going to be presenting. A lot of numbers, a lot of information, and people are probably going to be leaving a meeting saying, wow, we had no idea. So I don't want to take any more away from that, but I think you have to understand <coughs> that this board has a very difficult job ahead of where we're going to end up. And the difficulty is balancing, you're right, the situation between where the taxes are and what it does to the public but also how you educate children, which really is our future. Whether you've talked about it in the form of the books this evening, or whether we're talking about it just in the form of opportunities that they have in the district. It is something that we're going to be dealing with, and we have to deal with over the next, as I say, two months. Basically, two months from now, we will walk in a budget, and we'll know what's going to happen.
with that, I will conclude those remarks and ask Dr. Uh, Mustaid, this is not here, Mr. Riley, any comments on the library? Mr. President, the library board met at the Palmer Branch on the 13th of March. Um, other than the resignation, there was no other uh, business permit to the school board. The next meeting will be uh, April 10th at 3 p.m. the library board room.